It's poured by the gallon, pumped and processed by a merry-go-round of high tech. Comes in different flavors, sits in the fridge or on your shelf, and helps make the unlikeliest of non-food products. Found in the barnyard, under the waters of the ocean, or even in a field of beans. Put on your mustache. It's the untold story of milk on Modern Marvels. The United States produces over 21 billion gallons of milk every year. That's an average of 23 gallons for each American. But don't let this seemingly simple substance fool you. The milk we know best may come by the gallon or carton, but it's also a versatile wonder that plays a key role in hundreds of products. Virtually all of that milk comes from 60,000 dairy farms in the United States, courtesy of more than 9 million cows bred specifically for the purpose. And for the past century, the aptly named milking machine has lent them a helping, mechanized hand. The gadget grasping the cow's teat is called the cup. It works just like her hand. It has a pulsation in each one of these cups. It's just a squeezing and a pulling effect. And what that does, it applies pressure to the cow's udder, and that causes her to release her milk into this milk machine. And then once the milk gets into this bowl right here, it has a vacuum, and the vacuum will take it through the hose and into a jar. One farmer can hand milk six average cows per hour. Using milking machines, he can milk more than 100 cows at the same time. As this tried and true tech keeps the milk flowing, how the farmer treats the cow can affect the milk she gives. The better we treat the animals, the longer they're gonna last, and the more milk they're gonna produce, and it's just what's best for the animal in return is, is best for us. 7,500 contented cows populate the Larry Shahady Dairy Farm near Fresno, California. It's one of many farms taking milking to a new level that improves cow comfort and increases production. As many as 80 cows at a time can ride one of two bovine carousels called De La Vol Rototech Parlors. The ritual occurs twice every day. Dairy cows are, are creatures of habit. They like to do the same thing every day without any changes to their routine. They're very happy going to the milk barn at the same time each day. The parlor works far more efficiently than an array of standard milking machines. Unleashing the flood of milk as much as 30% faster. Workers lining the parlor near the entry point prep the cows after they hop aboard. As the cows rotate to the workers' positions, they sanitize each cow's teats with an iodine solution, then attach the cups. Once the actual unit is attached, the process is um, a vacuum line that comes in and stimulates the cow uh, with pulsation in order to extract the milk from the teats. During that time, she'll basically be left alone for a period of time. Within about seven minutes, the milking is complete. A flow sensor detects when Bessie is running on empty. When that flow sensor is triggered to be a lower flow, then it'll automatically take the units off, and then she'll be ready to leave. Rotary parlors are ideal for large farms, efficiently milking a lot of cattle in a short time. For cost-conscious farms with less than 500 cows, the Robotic Voluntary Milking System or VMS, might just be the ticket. It helps eliminate the need for farmhands to lend the cows an assist. With a voluntary milking system, it removes all those individuals from the parlor because we're bringing the milking machine out to the cows. The voluntary system is something that the cows are truly at free choice to come and get milked when they want to. The VMS plays into a dairy cow's instinctive desire to deliver her milk. 
If she withholds her milk for as little as two days, she could dry up within one week. When a cow enters the VMS unit, it is scanned for height, weight, and then a robotic arm will come in and image process the actual individual cow. The entire process is automated. Look, Ma, no human hands. As high-tech as modern dairy equipment has become, the creature it revolves around may be the greatest marvel of all. Today's dairy cow spends up to eight hours every day eating nearly 100 pounds of feed and drinking 80 gallons of water in order to produce up to 10 gallons of milk seven days a week. That's three times more productive than her forerunners just 50 years ago. One reason for this quantum leap in productivity is modern breeding. Another is a more nutritious diet. There's much more information available today. We have a nutritionist that comes out to the dairy farm once a month and analyzes the feed and puts together a very efficient ration combining proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. A dairy cow starts producing milk at age two after she delivers her first calf. Farmhands usually separate mother and calf permanently within one hour of the birth. A key reason for this is to prevent the calf from introducing harmful bacteria to its mother's udder. Workers then bottle feed the calf with the mother's milk. After one month, the mother begins her professional life as a milk producer. The calf, it will transition to solid feed. A male might be sold as a beef cow, occasionally for veal, or go on to be a stud for breeding. A female will likely follow in her mother's footsteps, providing milk to the farmer. They are going to be milked at least twice a day, uh, seven days a week, 305 days straight. Uh, they are off for 60 days. They have their next baby calf, and they are going to start the milking process all over again, twice a day, 305 days straight. The milk she produces is a nutrient-rich liquid that's 87% water. The process begins when four chambers in her stomach digest food and break down its nutrients. The nutrients then enter her bloodstream. Within one hour, more than 400 gallons of blood has passed through her circulatory system and transported nutrients that help to become one gallon of milk in her mammary glands. Her mammary glands are going to take the nutrients from this food in the water that she does eat and drink and turns it into the milk basically for her baby calf, but because she gives so much, that's where we get the milk. A cow's milk exits her udder at approximately 90 degrees Fahrenheit. To safely preserve it until it can be transported to a processing plant, dairy farmers pump it to refrigerated storage tanks, like this one at Billings Farm in Woodstock, Vermont. This is a pretty standard bulk tank that you would normally find on a small dairy farm. It holds 600 gallons of milk. The bulk tank's job is to cool the milk down to about 37 or 38 degrees Fahrenheit. The milk is picked up every 48 hours and sent off to a processing center to be made into dairy products. Although the cow is our most abundant source of milk, producing an average of 80 pounds per day with about three to 5% milk fat, Milk flows from all of nature's mammals. A human female produces roughly two pounds of milk a day. The mouse, five hundredths of a pound. The pig, 13 pounds. The horse, 30 pounds. But no mammal, not even the cow, can come close to the output of the humpback whale. A mother provides a whopping 1,000 pounds of milk to its calf every day, with 42% milk fat. Its milk also contains about twice the protein of most mammals, and nearly half the water content. Its consistency, that of toothpaste, makes it easier for the humpback calf to consume in water. This treasure of nutrition helps the calf gain an off-the-chart 200 pounds every day, for the first several weeks of its life. Holy cow. 
Among our more familiar bovine milk producers, one breed dominates. 91% of all dairy cows are Holstein. The Shahedi farm stocks no other kind. Just one of these Holsteins can churn out 23,000 gallons in a single year. They produce the highest amount of milk, and they produce the milk that is closest in nutrient composition than that which be found in fluid milk consumed in a bottle from a store. The Holstein may be the queen of today's barnyard, but 4,000 years ago, other cows ruled. Humans had already domesticated several breeds, including the predecessor to this impressive cow, the Yankol Watusi. Native to Africa, this breed continues to supply milk there today and has been dubbed the cattle of kings. The Watusi are one of the oldest breeds on record. They are in the pictorial graphs of the Egyptian pyramids. They were originally kind of an Egyptian longhorn, and about 2,000 years ago, they were crossbred a little bit with the zebu, the longhorn zebu, and kind of made the, the Watusi breed. The Watusi flourished throughout arid Africa, partly because of its prominent horns. The reason for the large diameter horns is that helps cool their body. And after where it's like 120 degrees, their, their blood flows through their horns like a radiator in a car and helps cool them. Herders considered their cows sacred and seldom slaughtered them for meat, figuring they could derive nearly as many nutrients from their milk. Many ancient African and Middle Eastern migrants spread into Europe, bringing cow's milk to new cultures. As populations moved across the Eastern European continent to Western Europe, more and more milk drinking happened. Centuries later, Europe's milk drinkers brought their cattle to the New World. In fact, it's those European breeds that power an industry now worth $27 billion. But how is the raw milk from thousands of farms transformed into over 19 million gallons of mainstream product every day. The United States dairy industry sells more than 7 billion gallons of fluid milk each year. To fill this massive demand, processing plants like Driftwood Dairy in El Monte, California, must work around the clock seven days a week. We're always receiving milk because the cows are always producing milk. So our tankers are coming in constantly. Every day, tankers deliver about 150,000 gallons of raw milk from nearby farms. Much of the milk that we have here was milk just four or five, six hours ago. So it's very fresh. Even so, Driftwood's lab analysts must test all the milk before the dairy accepts it. Fat and salt content has to fall within the plant standards. And the milk must be free of any antibiotics, since some people are severely allergic to them. Antibiotics would only be present if given to milk-producing cows. If it's positive, we will reject the load. It will go back to the dairy farm, and we will not receive it. If Driftwood approves the load of milk, workers pipe it into the facility. The first task at hand is to separate it. Raw milk naturally separates into its cream content and skim milk. The cream is the milk's concentrated fat source, while the skim is the non-fat liquid. The fat globules are less dense and more buoyant than the liquid, allowing the cream to float to the top. The spinning action of this machine, the centrifugal separator, simply accelerates the process separating 6,000 gallons of milk every hour. The separator consists of layers of cone-shaped disks. They spin together around 7,000 revolutions per minute. This forces the heavier skim to gravitate to the outside while the cream flows down the center. And now we have cream that's approximately 40% butter fat and skim that's less than one-tenth of a percent of butter fat. 
The skim portion serves as the basis for the dairy's fluid milk. The cream will be blended back in with other ingredients inside a batch tank to achieve the desired taste and fat content in a variety of products, including flavored milks. Today we're making dripless strawberry splash. One of our ingredients is strawberry base. We add vitamins. They also add condensed skim for more protein, as well as cream for the right amount of butter fat. We add just enough sugar to make it good and sweet, but not to harm our children. Though blended, the milk is still raw. It must be heated or pasteurized to kill virtually all the bacteria it contains. The milk, chilled to 38 degrees Fahrenheit, flows into a heat exchanger, which heats it to 162 degrees. The hot milk then moves into a holding tube for 15 and a half seconds to meet the legal standard for pasteurization. We then pump it back through our pipes to our cooling section where we cool the milk back to 38 degrees. The pasteurization process takes less than 40 seconds and kills 99% of the milk's bacteria. Before the advent of pasteurization, most milk the consumers ingested was raw. Bacteria in the milk multiplied and caused spoilage, exposing millions to potentially deadly microorganisms. In 1862, French scientist Louis Pasteur pioneered a solution as he was attempting to solve the same spoilage problem for wine. He would preserve the quality of the beverage, yet inactivate the spoilage organisms. And that was really the basis of pasteurization, which then caught on in the dairy sector. By the 1930s and 40s, they started to recognize that in addition to preventing spoilage, it was also reducing the incidence of foodborne outbreaks associated with consumption of milk products. Today, over 95% of the milk we buy in the store is pasteurized. But most dairies, like driftwood, follow up pasteurization with a process called homogenization. In tanks like this one, milk fat breaks down into small uniform particles throughout the milk. The way it works is real simple. We take the milk particle and slam it against the wall. And so we make the fat particle so very small that it can't rise to the top of the glass ever again. After Driftwood packages the milk, it's stored in a refrigeration area at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Then trucks ship the milk to schools, restaurants, and other businesses throughout Southern California. Samples of the milk you enjoy at home have often been taste tested by industry experts to help ensure a safe and consistent product. And many such experts are groomed at colleges, like Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, here, students educate their palates and prep for competitions against other milk tasting teams across the United States. You just have to know what you're looking for and make sure you recognize the four main senses of taste, like your sweet, your sour, your salty, and your bitter taste. Then after that, everything else, you have to be able to program it in your mind and be able to recognize the unique flavors. The team smells, tastes, and spits out a number of different milks identifying the characteristics of each one. It smells like grass. It smells like grass, okay. I went cooked and feed eight. Cooked and feed eight. Cooked and feed nine. Cooked and feed nine. Cooked and feed eight. Cooked and feed eight. Feed, and feed, eight. feed smell is just smell of alfalfa hay or any type of feed that the cow has been eating. This milk has an onion garlic smell to it. What would happen is that the milk processor will taste the milk first and make sure that these flavors don't get into consumer milk. Most consumers will not be able to pick that up, but students who train in dairy science and technology will pick it up. Still, you might detect differences in the taste of your milk depending on how it's packaged. Glass bottles, obviously, or any glass would not pick up any odors of the container. 
However, glass bottles still allow light to go through, so you can pick up oxidized flavors in that milk. Some dairies in the past remedied this by selling tinted glass bottles. In the 1930s, opaque cardboard containers debuted, which were similar to the cartons common today. Modern plastic jugs like these also prevent the milk from absorbing light and altering its taste. But what is it about milk that makes it good for you? Milk is clearly almost a perfect food because when you take it in, all the elements of it contribute to your health. Milk supplies us with a variety of vitamins and minerals, as well as protein for our muscles. But another big reason your mother always told you to drink milk was for the calcium to build strong bones. The reason people eat dairy products, and particularly women, is because it's the best single source of calcium that we have. As more non-dairy drinks tempt consumers, the dairy industry continually offers us more choices in milk. One milk variety, lactose-free, appeals to over 30 million Americans with varying degrees of lactose intolerance. Their bodies can't properly metabolize lactose, the milk sugar contained naturally in every glass. More than 70% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. And some experts believe that's because only those descended from ancient Europe's heavy milk drinking herders inherited the genetic tolerance. Meanwhile, there's good news for all lovers of milk, especially chocolate milk. Some health officials have declared this kid's favorite as a healthy energy drink. There's no extra calories, there's no extra fat or pounds. All there is is a great extra intake of good nutrients. So I'm hoping that everybody goes for chocolate milk. I think it's a great idea. While you chug down your chocolate milk, answer this. What happens to milk when it's spun, stirred, or rocked. Over one and a half billion pounds of butter are produced in the United States every year. At facilities like this one in Issaquah, Washington. Behind me is the Dairy Coal Issaquah Creamery. This plant was built in 1909. Today it is producing over 10% of the butter manufactured in the United States. But what's in that butter? It's essentially a combination of a little water, a dash of salt, some milk protein, and a gut-busting 80% milk fat. The fat and protein arrive at the Dairy Gold Creamery in the form of 1.5 million pounds of cream, arriving daily from four plants throughout the Northwest and Idaho. Like milk at a dairy processing plant, the cream undergoes pasteurization. Then it chills in a cooling tank for 12 hours at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, converting the liquid milk fat into a more solid consistency. The firmed up cream then makes its way to the churn. Our butter churn's one of the largest churns in the world. It can process over 50,000 pounds of cream in an hour. When the cream comes in at the top of the churn, it enters the beater section or primary churning chamber. Here, a large drum rotates at up to 1,500 RPM. This causes fat granules to form and begin to stick together. Next, the granules and the remaining liquid, buttermilk, drop into an adjacent chamber. Within the chamber, two large augers revolve in opposite directions. These augers compress the granules and force out the buttermilk. The resulting solid, now butter, squeezes through a plate with holes, separating it into strands that expose more of the butter's surface area. At the same time, it enters a vacuum chamber. The chamber removes 99% of the butter's oxygen, making it denser and less prone to spoilage. In a final chamber, salt is blended in, and the completed product oozes into a vat called the butter boat. The butter boat then is the main storage vessel where it's pumped out to our butter lines, either the large bulk packer or into quarters, patties, chip, or 68-pound boxes. 
the basic principles applied in this industrial scale operation date back centuries to an era when the common man made his own butter at home. These early butter makers started the process by allowing their milk to sit and sour for 24 hours until the cream floated to the surface. Then they carefully skimmed it off. Churning the cream required some more basic tech and a strong hand. What I'm using is called a daisy churn, which was patented in 1905. And what we do here is a series of simple machines with gears and a crank and a paddle, and it churns or stirs the cream up. Wondering why simply stirring the cream makes it so much thicker? It breaks the slippery outer shells of the cream's fat globules, exposing the sticky portion inside. All of a sudden, the fat particles are gonna to stick together. You just have to be patient and crank for a while. It all depends on the temperature of the cream. Sometimes it takes 15 minutes and sometimes it takes 40 minutes. Housewives and children churned enough for the family and a little extra to sell in town. At the turn of the 20th century, small creameries like the Billings Farm in Woodstock, Vermont, we're using innovative ways to produce butter in bulk. Today, the farm serves as an agricultural museum that offers programs demonstrating early butter making methods. Step one, separate more cream faster. By cooling cans of milk in cold water, workers allowed cream fat to firm up and float to the top in 11 hours instead of an entire day. We've just drawn off the skim milk, and that will be fed to the hogs. Uh, as a byproduct of the butter making uh, process, skim milk was considered to be unfit for human consumption. While the skim ran off to a barrel, the cream made its way to a tempering vat. And finally to what was called a swing churn, driven by a water-powered motor. It required no paddle. Instead, the churn agitated the cream by swinging it back and forth. After a few hours, the farm had fresh butter to pack up. And we will firmly pack it in to be sure that we have that pound of butter that that consumer is so interested in. While butter spread across America in the 20th century, another milk-based product caught on with consumers and still remains popular, yogurt. Dannon, one of the industry leaders, operates plants in 40 nations and three in the United States, including this one in Fort Worth, Texas. The company produces nearly one third of America's yogurt. The Dannon company uses more than three million pounds of milk each day to make our yogurt products. That milk comes from dairy farmers pretty close to where we have our plants in Utah, Ohio, and here in Texas. The ingredients of this thick, creamy treat are pasteurized skim milk and billions of healthy bacteria, grown or cultured under controlled laboratory conditions. The cultures that are used around the world to transform milk into yogurt are called Lactobacillus bulgaricus and Streptococcus thermophilus. In nature, both of these healthful bacteria are harbored in your gastrointestinal tract, producing lactic acid that inhibits the growth of harmful bacteria. After Dannon adds its cultures to the milk, the mixture is transferred to large fermentation tanks, heated to just over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. This excites the bacteria, causing them to absorb some of the milk's lactose, in turn, releasing lactic acid. After as long as 10 hours, the lactic acid gives the milk the tangy flavor we expect in yogurt. And it encourages milk proteins to coagulate and form the yogurt's gel-like texture. In a batch tank, the fermented plain yogurt may be blended with flavoring and fruit before packaging. Dannon's unblended yogurts, with fruit on the bottom, 
ferment for up to 10 hours inside their individual cups in a specially heated room. After all the yogurt is properly fermented, one final step remains before shipping. Danon must cool all its products to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit to inhibit any additional growth of cultures. There's no denying the final product tastes good, but is eating bacteria good for you? It's bacteria, healthy bacteria, that when you consume enough of it, it has a health benefit. The bacteria help us with our body's defenses, they help us with digestion and regularity, they help us with many important bodily functions. Yogurt needs refrigeration to stay fresh, but a milk product in a can has a shelf life most foods would die for. The Galloway Company in Nina, Wisconsin stores a lot of milk in order to make specialty products. The two largest tanks in front of you each hold 60,000 gallons. Now 60,000 gallons of raw milk is enough to give a glass of milk to a million people. One of Galloway's main product lines is sweetened condensed milk for the food industry. Just like the canned milk in your kitchen, it makes a number of treats a lot sweeter. Galloway's massive raw milk supply passes through a centrifugal separator to isolate its skim portion. The next step in the process removes 70% of the skim milk's water. It happens within this system of tubes called a reverse osmosis filter. Pumps force the skim under high pressure into the vessels. Inside the vessels are semi-permeable membranes consisting of multiple layers of molecular-sized pores. The milk molecules are too large to penetrate, but the water molecules are small enough to fit through and flow into the membrane's core. The filtered water exits the end of each vessel before it's flushed from the system. The concentrated milk flows onto a blending tank, where it mixes with cream and liquid sugar, which helps preserve the milk and add the desired sweetness. This new mixture will be pasteurized and then have additional water removed in a giant evaporator. Behind me is Galloway Company's evaporator. Basically, we're taking a mixture of milk and sugar and we're boiling some of the water away to make it more concentrated. The evaporator consists of a number of towers called calandrias. Milk enters the top of each calandria and flows down a number of stainless steel tubes. Steam surrounding each tube boils the milk as it falls. At the bottom, the vapor and concentrated milk flow into a separator, where the vapor flows out the top, and the milk is pumped into the next calandria. The process repeats itself several times, until the desired amount of water is removed from the condensed formula. Finally, the milk is piped into storage tanks, destined to become part of a variety of sweet treats. As much as we rely on this sweet canned milk today, over 150 years ago, it was a revolutionary idea for Gail Borden, founder of the Borden Milk Company. He solved a daunting problem before the age of refrigeration. He could preserve the milk and keep it in a can for a long period of time. Borden's milk had a shelf life of at least one year, which was good news for soldiers in America's Civil War, at isolated battlefields with no dairy cow in sight. In the 1920s, workers at the Carnation Milk Company preserved milk another way, this time without the sugar. After evaporating the water from the milk, machines injected the milk into a can, then sealed and heated it. This evaporated milk, like Borden's sweetened milk, lasted over a year before it spoiled. Over the years, as people got refrigeration in their home, it became very popular to use evaporated milk in place of whole milk in recipes. In the 1950s, Carnation marketed yet another innovative consumer product, non-fat dry milk, with a recommended shelf life of one year. 
Just add water and you've got milk. Dry milk is really a preserved milk ingredient, so it can be shipped around the world to where uh, they don't have a fresh milk supply. The Dairy Products Technology Center at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo uses a small-scale plant to research industry methods for drying milk. Like the canned milk process, milk must first flow through an evaporator. When it exits that vacuum evaporator, we've now removed about three quarters of the water, and now we have about a solution that's about 50% solids. Then the concentrated milk is sprayed as a mist inside a drying chamber. Here, the milk droplets dry as they interact with hot air, piped in at about 450 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And in the end, you wind up with a powder that looks like this. The drying process is not only reserved for whole milk, but can also be applied to each of its components. Concentrated and powder forms of lactose, milk fat, protein, and minerals help add sweetness or nutrition to everything from cereal to orange juice. Lactose even finds its way into your medicine cabinet. It's used by the pharmaceutical industry to provide coatings to make pills and things easy to swallow. But no milk component has more diversity in its uses than casein, a type of protein. Casein is a key part of many cheeses because it has adhesive properties that help it serve as a stabilizer or binder. It's also in sausage and salad dressings. The same properties make casein a key additive in non-food products as well, from paint to glue to cosmetics. Milk's versatility and usefulness is undeniable, but we don't get it only from cows. Anybody out there willing to milk a water buffalo? Come on, Queenie. It's a typical morning for Julie and Rob Style on their River Valley Ranch, just 25 miles east of Seattle, Washington. They'll milk four cows, more than 50 goats, Good girl. Good girl. one stubborn water buffalo, and a couple of yaks. <laughs> My husband fears every day when I leave in my truck because he knows if, if there is something that can milk, I will bring it home. All the milk they squeeze out here is used to make specialty cheeses. They've learned the hard way that milking any animal that doesn't move poses some unique challenges. The technology is really developed for cows. You know, versus our exotic animals. There's not a whole lot of equipment that is readily made and available for us to purchase to, um, to milk them. Julie and Rob milk the yaks in the same parlor they use for the cows. But the yaks' teats are more like sheep's. It's not as pronounced, so it's a little bit more up inside them. Um, once you start milking them and they relax and they're eating, they start to let down. Just kind of like a cow does, but it's a little different process with the yaks. Yak milk contains twice the casein of cow's milk, which yields more cheese. But a yak only produces one quart of milk a day, one thirtieth the amount of a cow. So Julie blends the yak milk with her water buffalo's three gallons, which also has comparable milk fat. And that's how I make our mozzarella. We label it as Wild West mozzarella because of that. And uh, we have chefs standing in line for that. But making the Wild West mozzarella hinges on getting stubborn Queenie, the water buffalo, into the milking stall. Queenie, Queenie. come on. Go, 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 go. Julie and Rob allow all their animals to graze on blackberry thickets in order to produce a distinct flavor in their cheeses. You take the cheese out and it just smells like fruit. So it definitely comes through what they, what they have eaten. Although the water buffalo throws the biggest shadow at the River Valley Ranch, the largest milk producers here are the goats. Okay, ladies, table for four. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Goat milk cheese has become one of the fastest growing specialty cheeses on the global market. 
nearly 50% of goat cheese in the United States is imported from other countries, providing a lucrative incentive for small farmers like the Stiles. It's in vogue in our area, and I'm sure across the country, to buy local, eat local, be local. Dairy goat farming can also be more economical. Goats eat less, require less land, and each time they give birth, they add not one, but two or more offspring to the farm. Each goat will produce up to about a gallon a day between two milkings, so a half gallon each milking. And within two hours, I have to have it cooled down to less than 40 degrees, or I have to have it in a cheese vat. The reason um, goat milk and buffalo and yak milk is whiter than uh, cow milk is because those animals transition their beta carotene into vitamin A before they milk. Another key difference between goat and cow milk is goat milk's protein formation. These formations trigger a milder reaction from consumers with milk allergies. Such advantages are making milks and cheeses from critters other than cows increasingly popular. And that will keep Julie Style in search of more exotic animals to squeeze dry. If I could milk an, another breed of an animal, llamas would be one that, that I would definitely milk. Today, animals are not the only source of milk. Plants contribute their share, too. Agricultural products, including rice, oats, and nuts, create a milky-looking beverage used today as a milk substitute. Featuring some similar nutritional benefits as animal milk, it's a milk, but without the animal. And in the world of these plant-based beverages, soy is king. In 1999, after being endorsed by the FDA, soy milk sales increased by 25%. Why? Because it's very high in protein, yes, vegetable protein, but it's very high in protein and it's easy, relatively, to process it into a beverage. Vegans and consumers with milk allergies or lactose intolerance can enjoy it. And since it has no animal fat, it's cholesterol free. On the other side, soy milk must be fortified with calcium and vitamins such as B12. There's a lot of consumer choice. That's what America's about, is consumer choice. Now, finally, we have in the marketplace true choices. Meanwhile, don't put the cow out to pasture anytime soon. The next time you douse your cereal, drink your latte, or eat your pizza, remember the iconic milk-producing marvel that's utterly indispensable.